أجل فرجاب صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Assalamu alaikum, brothers, sisters, inshallah you guys are all doing well. It's uh, my pleasure to be here and to see uh, all of you and uh, get to know all of you, especially the youth uh, who I'm very uh, keen and proud of knowing. Uh, today's talk is going to be about uh, femininity, masculinity within Islam, as the brothers have mentioned. Uh, inshallah, Sayyid Hussain is going to tackle um, you know, the masculine element, and I'm going to be talking more about the feminine element. Traditionally, when we speak about <coughs> femininity within Islam, we tend to talk a lot about, uh, you know, we will bring in a hadith here, a hadith there, and we say, all right, this is what the Imam says, that's it, let's go, let's take it, let's run with it. And that's a very good uh, approach. We have to bring hadith to inform our perspective on femininity within Islam. But unfortunately, we don't go deeper to address some of the uh, discomfort that happens when it comes to talking about things like gender roles, like patriarchy, and where this discomfort actually stems from, where it arises from. So today we want to take a more uh, in-depth approach, perhaps a more philosophical approach, to addressing gender, to addressing the feminine, and through, uh, to addressing some of the discomforts that come with engaging with notions of femininity, maybe with certain ahadith, because uh, Hussein is going to talk a little bit about uh, you know, the masculine, about uh, roles of leadership, about knowing and learning how to be a, a patriarch in the family. And uh, I think it's important that we set up a groundwork uh, from which we can actually receive these kinds of uh, gems and guidance uh, and maybe uh, open our hearts to some of the discomforts that we might experience as we're receiving this information. We won't want to take a bandage approach to femininity, perhaps masculinity as well. We want to take a more deeper uh, approach to some of the value systems that we inherit that might prevent us from leaning into these roles, from leaning into this ideology, which our tradition and the Imams and the Ahlul Bayt have emphasized and modeled for us to see. So today's topic, I'm going to actually talk a little bit about the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From that, I'm going to talk a little bit about capitalism, about the society around us, about real concrete things that exist in society. And I'm going to bring that all together to address the issue. I like to call it the issue and problems and the discomforts people have when taking into account gender roles, especially when taking into account the, the word femininity and uh, the connotations that might have in the modern world. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran, He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَأَيْنَ مَا تَوَلُّوا فَثُمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهُ Wherever you turn, there is the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have a face that we're looking at, but this ayah is a good indicator to show that wherever we trace, wherever we look, we are looking at traces of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names. We are looking at signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names manifest before us. And the way in which we're encouraged to interact with this world of existence, with this world of wujud, with this being, is to interact with it as a sign, as an ayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our holy Quran is replete with uh, <coughs> verses that say, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ These are signs, these are signs, these are signs. The turning of the day into night, the seasons, uh, the partners that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates for us, and many other things, the stars, the night sky, the turning of the, the time, all of these, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, these are signs for people that reflect. And so the way in which we're encouraged to interact with this alam of wujud is, is as if we're interacting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's af'al, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's actions, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names. We're encouraged to interact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his names. وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءِ الْحُسْنَى فَادْعُوهُ بِهَا to God belongs the Asma al Husna, these names. So ask through these names. Come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through these names. Get to know these names. See how these ma names manifest in the world around you. And so this world is a reflection of the divine. It's a way in which we draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and get to know the names. And hopefully, as we get to know the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more, we begin to internalize these names within ourselves. <coughs> uh, the hadith goes, Al Insan ala surati rabbi. Uh, man was created in the image of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning what? Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has certain names, certain attributes, get to know them, تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ اللَّهِ The Holy Prophet says. Try to adopt the mannerisms, try to take on these attributes yourself, learn from them. Use this world of wujud to interact with the names and to internalize the names also. So through this world of existence, through the seasons, we see names of when the, 
the trees die, we see the names of Al-Mumit. When the trees come to life, we see the names of Al-Muhi. Uh, when a mother gives birth and she's interacting with her child, we see the name of Ar-Rahma from the word Rahim, womb. We see that Rahma come to life. Through these various experiences, through the way she interacts with her child, we see the name Al-Wadud, Al-Ra'uf, the kind, the loving. We see these names come to life through the way in which we interact with life and existence itself. We're encouraged to interact with life as though it's a lesson. Attributes of God coming to life. تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ الله. So this is the duality that we're interacting with. We have Al-Muhi, Al-Mumit. We have night and day. We have this polarity that we see in all of life, life and death. And so too, when we look at the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now God is one, so when we say the names, we're not talking about the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one, He's always one. When we're talking about the variety of names or the multiplicity of names Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is, is talking about and referring to Himself through, this is just the way in which we receive God's names. Because we cannot understand how God is both muhi and mumit, and how those in God are one and the same, we interact and compartmentalize. This is how we receive the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and understand the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then when we're talking about these names, it's not that God is one time he's this, one part of him is this. No, he is one. The way we receive his af'al, we see, okay, when he's bringing something to life, we call him al-muhi. When he's taking life away, we call him al-mumit. Now, the way in which uh, these names come to life, we say Adam was created in the names of majesty and Eve was created through the names of uh, beauty. So these names that we interact with have a feminine component and a masculine component. So for example, when we see the name Al-Walud, the loving, we say this is a feminine name. Linguistically, it's, uh, or the way in which we attribute this action, we say this is a feminine name. When we say Al-Ra'uf, the kind, we see this is a feminine name. When we see Al-Muhayman, the one who oversees, the one who overtakes, we say this is, a ma- this is a name of majesty, a masculine name. Al-Qawi, masculine. Uh, Al-Muntaqim, the avenger, masculine. Al-Ra'uf, Al-Rahim, beauty, names of beauty. These are the names of Eve, we say. These are predominantly in Eve and the predominance of the names of majesty in Adam. Here you have this predominance and the separation between the feminine and the masculine the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala coming to life through each. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about marriage and he says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَلْفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا It's from his signs that you have from yourselves these spouses. Meaning marriage itself, it's a way to see these names come to life. So when a man takes on the role of being a patriarch, he is just, he is leading, he is strong in his leadership, you're supposed to see and contemplate the names of majesty through your spouse. And when you are forgiving, when you are kind, when you are merciful, when you're interacting with your children, again, the husband contemplates these names, sees these names come to life through the woman. And not only do you see, but you learn from each other. Not only do these names come to life through each gender, through each of the spouses, but you begin to contemplate these names and you learn to internalize these names. So from my husband, I learn how to be just. I learn how to be grounded, whatever I do. From him, from me, he learns how to be merciful in certain situations, how to be calm, for example, uh, really operate through calmness, really. So we learn from each other. We see these names come to life and we internalize such names through our interactions. This is the duality that we're, we're seeing, we're witnessing. This is the dynamic that's healthy for us to witness so that we can internalize it and so that we can also create families that are healthy in such a dynamic. <coughs> so we see almost... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have a hadith qudsi, abdi atani takun mathali takul shay, kun fayakun, my servant, worship me. You become like me insofar as you say for a thing, be and it is. So when we try to internalize the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we draw to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala closer through his names, we are aligning with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way in which he wishes for us to align. When we talk about femininity, when we talk about internalizing the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're calling for a healthy dynamic in society. Healthy dynamic in the home between man and between women. And yet, a lot of times when we address or talk about the feminine names, discomfort arises. Despite everything that underlies the feminine, despite the fact that even when we approach to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are going through the names of beauty. No one goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness and says, Ya Adil, oh just one, forgive me. We don't want the justice when we have erred. So we say, oh Rahman, oh Rahim, oh Rauf. 
we, we go through the names of beauty. Although we operate so much through the names of beauty when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, although every chapter except one in the Holy Quran starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, through the name of the compassionate and the merciful, why is it that when we encourage attributes of beauty in women, we find it to be derogatory? Even though within our own experience to the faith, we go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot of the times through his attributes of beauty. In fact, Ibn Arabi says that sometimes he would he would call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the attributes of beauty. But we don't emphasize that too much because when we call on God through beauty, through beauty, sometimes we get a bit comfortable. Right? He's Rahman, he's Rahim. We forget that he's also Shadid al-Aqab. So that's why Imam Salih says, Bain al-Khawfi wa raja stay between fear and hope. Make sure you're always towing the line. Not too much beauty, not too much majesty. But when it comes down to it, we rely a lot on the names of beauty. So why is it that for us, in our own lives, these are names that we feel, no, merciful. That's, a, that's not the attribute of someone who's valuable. Strength, rather, is a better attribute to embody, right? This is why when we talk about patriarchy, everyone gets very uncomfortable. Patriarchy as in the man leading the household. Why? Leadership itself for us is a value. Leadership for us is a status symbol, meaning if a man is leading the family, we think that's, that means better. Even though, إِنَّا كَرَمَكُمْ عَنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاقُمْ The best or the, the, the one that has the most karamah before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, most value before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that is most pious. But we see, no, leadership itself is the qualifier of value. And so when we're talking about patriarchy, we keep that in the background. We don't even address the fact that you and I have this presupposition about leadership. Um, uh, Ibn Abbas narrates a story with Amir al-Mu'mineen. He says that he once walked into the tent of Amir al-Mu'mineen and he found Amir al-Mu'mineen cleaning his sandals. And then the Imam turns, this is Amir al-Mu'mineen, he's cleaning his sandals. And the Imam turns to Ibn Abbas, he says, and Ibn Abbas remembers this, he says, Ibn Abbas, what, are the va what is the value of these sandals? And Ibn Abbas says, nothing. You know, I mean, they're, they're worth nothing. They have holes in them, they're worn out, they're torn apart. These sandals, they're worth nothing. And he says, Ibn Abbas, these, these sandals have more value in my eyes than this authority and this leadership in this caliphate. Even Amir al-Mu'mineen, when he's saying, this leadership in my eyes, it means nothing. The only, ta the only reason I assume this role of being a leader is for the sake of my constituents so I can look over them, protect them, protect the faith of Rasulullah. Leadership was not a status symbol. Even when we look at Wilayat al-Faqih, the way it was given to Sayyid Khamenei, you had the authority of the jurists, they came together, 20 plus people, trying to decide who is the authority of the jurists, who is the wilayah of the Faqih going to go to. Sayyid Khamenei was amongst them. And they chose him. When he, they chose him, he cried. He didn't want the leadership. He didn't want the responsibility because Leadership for them, it's not a status symbol. It's, it's a burden, a response, a heavy responsibility. Isa alayhi salam, we have stories where he would be washing the feet of his companions. The way we see leadership is very much conflated with the value systems that we've internalized. Leadership, power, dominance, that is everything. That is the qualifier of value. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear about what qualifies value in, uh, in our tradition. Very clear. So then there's a value system that we've inherited that we haven't even realized we've inherited. Because to be the patriarch, oh, you men have a very heavy responsibility because you're going to be asked. You are, you are the responsible party. You're going to be asked. And it's a very heavy burden responsibility from our tradition. We see that. So we have to step back and say, okay, where is this value system coming from and how have we inherited it? We want to take not a surface level approach, we want to go deep, re-evaluate where are these ideas coming from and what qualifies my value. So here, over the years, I spent a lot of time trying to look into this, to research this, where is this discomfort coming from? And after a lot of time, a lot of research, I started to see some overlap. Who's heard of Marx, the philosopher, right? Okay, Marx, 
not bad, yeah. So Marx is one of, I would say, the mo one of the most famous philosophers of our time. His name is well known. And Marx had a very interesting idea. He talks about where ideas come from. The ideas of any society, any culture, he says, what is the source of these ideas? People think they have their theories, that ideas come from minds, they're created. He says, no. His theory that all ideas, all ideological systems stem from a single thing. This thing, he calls it the base. The ideas, he calls the superstructure. So every th the superstructure of value, of ideas, of worldview, comes from the space. What is the space? The labor force, the market. Something so interestingly simple. All of this idea, these value systems that arise, come from the labor force, the marketplace. So he has a very interesting take on capitalism. We're going to talk a little bit about this, and then we're going to tie it to gender, because this is very intricate. All of our lives, all of civilizations, humans have worked. So capitalism was, wasn't always present. Humans have always worked. Humans have always labored. In the very beginning, humans wanted to wean themselves from their vulnerability to nature. They were very susceptible to the effects of nature. Right? Uh, they would die from illnesses, bacteria, uh, climates, cold, foraging for food. The first step was how do we uh, become sustainable and wean ourselves from our vulnerability to nature. That was the first thing. Okay, we learned. We learned how to shelter ourselves, create shelter. We learned how to make fire to cook our foods. We learned how to make fire to warm ourselves so that we don't freeze to death in the winter. We learned to hunt and to gather. We learned all of these. Okay, now we know how to survive <coughs> in nature. Then the discussion changed. Not do I, how do I survive in nature? But how do I thrive? How do I use nature for my own means? Then you have trade. Trade, trade arose. So then n communities came together. Listen, you're very good at making this. You're good at making this. Let's trade. You can make the shoes. You have great craftsmanship. I will give you the leather, leather from my sheep. Right? There was this trade that happened. Humans were working together. And then the trade routes expanded. You got spices from different countries. You got leather, you got fabrics, and civilization grew. There was craftsmanship. People worked. They expressed their creativity through their work. Right? The boots that you would purchase back then, they would last you forever. They were handmade. People devoted themselves to their work. And not only that, their work became an expression of their humanity. Because one of the things that separates humans from animals is their creativity, their ability to use tools. They find their expression in their creativity, rather. So then you have that expansion happening. But the mark of capitalism is further. It's not how do I thrive in nature. It's how do I, and it's not how do I survive in nature. It's how do I dominate nature to expand my own legacy, my empire. Because people lost notion of the hereafter, the project became how do I create a heaven on earth? If I'm going to die and that's it, how do I immortalize myself here in the dunya? So now it became a question of dominance of nature, asserting yourself over nature. When this happened, you have the onset of capitalism. Capitalism isn't just work. No, capitalism is how do I subsume every area of life under capital? Capital meaning money, profit. How do I maximize as much profit from the world I have today? So then from that, you have the commodification of every facet of life. Commodification from the word commodity. Commodity is anything valuable, anything that you can exchange for money. How do I make more and more things into commodities? So for example, in Lebanon, parts of this beach, of the ocean, the shoreline is owned by private people. If you want to access this shoreline, ocean. It's owned by someone. One of the greatest wonders of the world, we have Ja'ita, this cave in Lebanon. Great wonder. You're not even allowed to enter with your phone because they're trying to preserve it. It's amazing. It's owned by a man in Germany. This privatization of even nature. They're going to sell you air if they could. They're already selling us bottled water. And if you cannot see how absolutely baffling that is, 
then you know we don't know what's coming because I really see us uh, you know on the path of getting air sold to us after all of the air pollution. This is all a mark of capitalism. Commodities, commodify, commodify. With capitalism, you have the detriment of everyone for the sake of the few. And we know this, we see this. All of these co cooperations, Hershey's, uh, Nestle, uh, you know, uh, even uh, Marvel, you know, they all go back to 2, 4, 5, 10, 15, 20 people. All of these corporations. So then it's, it's the detriment of everyone for the benefit of the few. Because part of, pat, uh, uh, part of the capitalism is I want you to offer me value. And the only way my capitalism will, will, will work is if I can take the value that you offer me and pay you less for it so that I profit. That's the mark of capitalism. It's how can I get the most surplus value out of your time and profit out of it. And the only reason I can profit is because I pay you less than the value that you offer me. That's capitalism. OK, so it unfolds. You commodify all of the different facets of life. How do I make everything into a commodity? Everything. And how do I get the most out of the value each person offers me? So what happens is, is that even the labor process itself lost all individual expression. Creativity was lost. So what happens, for example, is instead of hiring an engineer to make me a car, right? An engineer, make me a car. Back then, boot, make me a boot. Get me everything, put it together, assemble it, and give it to me. One person would take charge of all of the uh, operations of making a boot, for example. Engineering, you say, OK, make me a car. But if I were to pay an engineer to make me a car, that's going to be very expensive. So what do I do? I take the quality out of a person's work, and I quantify it, meaning I basically create machines out of people. So look at Ford Company, for example. I'm from Dearborn. The origins of the automobile, we call, they call us the metro city, because the origins of the automobile started in Detroit. And you have Ford in Detroit, even Chrysler and GM. But Ford was started with the factories of building cars. How did they do it? They didn't hire engineers. What they did was they brought refugees. The reason most Lebanese people are actually on Dearborn is because uh, of Ford. They came, pennies on a dollar, sold their time to work in factories. But they mechanized the labor process insofar as, listen, I'm not going to hire an engineer. That's too much money. All I want you to do is take this and put it here. And you take this and put it here. Take out the quality of the work, make it into something I can quantify. And then you pay them minimum wage, and then you have your car. And this is how uh, quality was abstracted from our labor. Creativity was abstracted from our labor. When this happened, what you had to do was you had to appeal from every part of you that makes you you in order to plug yourself into this machine of capitalism, because that's all you became, an appendage to a greater machine. And you think you're not getting duped. You think you're getting your value. You think this is the way of life that you want. But it's actually, you're just a robot in a greater system. At one point, you, you feel like you're active. Oh, I'm creating my work. I'm active in my work. But as you're creating and being active in your work, you're contributing to a greater system that you are passively absorbed by. It's actually shaping you, what he calls a second nature. So you go to work every day. You clock in 8 to 5. You do what you're told. You get a paycheck for your life. And you think that this is normal. Marx. For example, he thinks this is so abnormal that you sell your time to live, and you live to sell your time. With the commodification of every facet of life, something very interesting happened. And this is the final straw. This is really what cemented capitalism, was the commodification of the self. So then you became a commodity to be bought and sold. And in order to be an appealing commodity in this world, you yourself had to take away certain parts of you, attributes of you, hobbies, curiosities, things that you're inclined towards. You had to peel those layers away. Right? We call these things a CV, very interesting word. And put the things about yourself that make you a most appealing commodity to be bought. Or otherwise, you're going to be sold. Buying and selling, we don't really talk about it in the labor force. Maybe in soccer, we talk about, sorry, football. You guys talk a lot, oh, he was bought and sold. That's a very abnormal way to talk about a human being. I might call it slavery. But on the labor market, the interesting thing is self-alienation occurs. You are not even yourself anymore, but the best part is, is you don't even know it. And when people talk about themselves, they say, you know, man, I used to love to read. I used to love to write. I used to love to ski. I used to love to be in nature. Uh, I used to have these dreams. A lot of people, you know, you come in your 30s, you start to realize, a lot of these things were crushed inside of me. 
They are. Why? To make you an appealing commodity, appealing to the employer. So in weaning ourselves from nature and dominating nature, we create a second nature that dominates us, that we're not even aware of. And we became self-alienated from the parts of ourselves that make us who we are. Now, let's step back and see how this all affects the theory of gender, particularly femininity. I want you to think about how this severely disadvantages the feminine and feminine attributes, because it disadvantages men as well, greatly, because even they can't connect with parts of themselves. But women especially, plugging themselves into this field, why does it have such a big disadvantage upon them? It's because capitalism itself thrives on masculine traits, traits of dominance, even shadow traits, shadow masculine traits, negative masculine traits, the dominance of nature. For example, the dominance of the nafs. If you were to operate in these fields, it's competitive. You have to overtake the next person, right? It's eat or be eaten. It's not a field of forgiveness, overlooking people. No, you go first. No, you take this opera. No. It's a field that's very much dominated by masculine qualities and sometimes negative masculine qualities. And so in order for a woman to thrive in these spaces, to commodify herself enough to be appealing to an employer, attributes that make her feminine, love, kindness, mercy, these are attributes that she has to basically put aside in order to actually not get eaten in this jungle of capitalism, in order to not be taken advantage of. Or if she has these attributes, they exploit it and use it against her. So they're a lot more likely to tell you, uh, work over time, and maybe they won't even uh, pay you for it. Whereas with men, they're more cautious. More so, we have statistics that prove that you are less likely to be hired if you are a mother uh, with a family, if you have a family at home, as opposed to a man that has the same qualifications, if not less qualifications, you're still less likely to be hired if you have more qualifications and you have these certain familial uh, um, obligations. So when we're dealing with this rising anxiety of women marrying, committing, aligning her mission and prioritizing her husband and kids, when we're dealing with anxiety, this anxiety, we need to ask why? Where is it coming from? And a lot of this is coming from the system that rewards uh, masculinity and ultra rewards even the toxic forms of it. Dominance at any cost, for example. And so we ourselves become estranged from these, 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 these values, these values of the feminine, such that we see power itself as inherently valuable. When you step back, you see, no, there's a different value system I've internalized, and where has it come from? What's it being informed by? you start to belittle the parts of you that make you this kind, feminine, you know, open woman. No, because these are traits that are not rewarded in this capitalist modern world. It's very scary. Sometimes when men have issues with when women start to work, it's not maybe the work itself as much as when she comes home, she doesn't know how to be feminine because she's always operating through that energy. So she comes home, she doesn't know how to take that off. For example, a lot of women say, bear with me, Ah, I'm not getting married because they're so intimidated by me. Sometimes they are intimidated. Sometimes it's that I am this working, very career-oriented woman. Maybe nothing wrong insofar as it's that, but I've forgotten what it means to be a woman. So that when I'm interacting with this potential suitor, I scare them away because I'm very, very masculine. This is what I want. Check my list. Uh, you know, one, two, three. Just very. Whereas the feminine aura, or the aura of the feminine, is lost. We don't even know we are. We have lost it or we don't even appreciate it because we, it's devalued in the system, and we don't even know how to step into it anymore. This is why it's very scary. So when Islam comes and says, you know, this is, this is the, the role of the mom, and this is the role of the wife, and not, this is also the value of both, and they are very high values, something is coming against that, something is contradicting that, and it's our assumptions about value. Gotta ask ourselves, where are these assumptions coming from? More so, we have a responsibility to acknowledge that this world has become very ugly. Aesthetically, it's a very ugly world. You know, it, there's no more beauty. The best thing we can do for Islam is to beautify it again. Part of a tr like becoming havens of beauty is for the feminine to reassume their roles, reintroduce these names 
of the Rahman, of the Rahim, of the Wadud, of the Rauf, reintroduce these names and seeing value in these names. One of the best things we can do in this world is reinstill value in the beauty, in the feminine. And seeing these things as values, seeing them for what they are, and not for what the modern world wants us to see it. This is uh, very, very important because when Sayyid Hussein is about to take the mic and talk about patriarchy and talk about leadership, I want us to go a bit inside, question where the discomfort is coming from, isolate it, tackle it, and re be, be pioneers of valuing beauty and instilling beauty, being havens and vessels of beauty so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names come to life through us in this world because heaven knows we don't need more uh, masculine dominance. We need femininity as well. We need beauty as well. The world needs beauty. Our homes need beauty. But not, when I say beauty, don't think the Hollywood beauty. Beauty as in beauty as a value, as an aura, as a sense of being, sense of peace. Our world needs that and it can only come if we reconnect with these values of femininity and see their importance. So with that, we need to step outside of a male-centric vision of value because a lot of us here have that. Let's not kid ourselves. Because when you tell people men and women are not the same, men are like, yeah, of course. Women are like, no. No, of course we're the same. Why is it that women see that as offensive but men don't? It means that for you being man-like is a sense of value. That itself tells you something about your system of value. God is saying, don't have a male-centric vision of value. Have a God-centric one. Shift it into a God-centric one. This is what these two days are about. How do we shift into a God-centric vision of value, especially as women, so that we can be pioneers in instilling beauty in our homes, beauty in our communities, and reconnect with our role as nurturers and upbringers of beauty. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.